Good morning, everybody. This is Thomas Felder, and I'm here uh, with Pastor Anthony Burrell, and we are doing another edition of our Daniel and Revelation uh, Bible study. Today, we're on Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. We are covering the seven trumpets. Yesterday, we covered four of the seven trumpets. We are going to cover uh, two more of the trumpets because uh, there's actually three remaining. And those three final trumpets are called woes, woes. Mm. Uh, so we're going to cover the three remaining woes, uh, which are part of the trumpets. And we're going to cover two of those today. We're going to cover two of those today. And uh, we'll come back and cover the third one because we skip a chapter uh, or two. And then we come back with the third woe. All right. So let's just pray and get going. Uh, dear Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace and your mercy and your kindness towards us. We thank you for today, your holy Sabbath day, Father, where we get a chance to spend time in your word. Let your spirit speak through us. Whatever you want us to say, let it come out. And whatever, Father, should not be said, keep it in. And we pray most of all that someone on this line will get a blessing and hide us behind the cross. Amen. Amen. Amen again. And your holy amen. son, Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah's name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're talking about these trumpets. It's, we're talking about the trumpets. Yesterday we covered uh, four of the trumpets, and those four trumpets covered the Eastern, sorry, the Western Roman Empire. They covered mm -hmm. the Western Roman Empire. And these trumpets all talk about forces that attack Rome. The first four are uh, dealt with pagan Rome, and the last three are going to deal with papal Rome. Papal Rome. So it deals with the Eastern Empire. The first uh, first two that we're going to cover today, the first two woes, will deal with the Eastern Roman Empire. But specifically, all of these are covering the Papal Roman Empire as we're going into the second portion of these woes. The letters uh, to the churches um, also deal with the, the same time periods that we're going to cover. So there is an overlapping of time periods. And God does that so we can see how he's moving, right? So you see the 395 to 419 on the, on the time periods on the bottom when we covered Alaric and then Genseric, Attila, and Odeesser. Those mm -hmm. time periods line up with the various churches. Those time periods line up with the churches, which is important because I know sometimes people say, how do you know that, that this particular trumpet meant this or that particular trumpet meant that? You remember when we looked at those time periods for those churches, um, and then we saw the seals lined up with those time periods, the trumpets lined up with the seals that lined up with the letters. Just like when Daniel was having his various revelations, Daniel uh, first saw the, the king saw the head of gold, chest of silver, waist of bronze, legs of iron, etc. And then later on in Daniel 7, we saw those same kingdoms emphasized as animals. We see them again when we got to uh, Daniel 10 through 12. And again, God goes into more and more detail. He loops and zeroes in. He loops and he zeroes in. No different here. No different here. Just like yesterday, when we talked about the trumpets mm -hmm. affected a third, a third part of the empire or a third part of the world, Again, the Bible is still talking about the Roman Empire. The mm. Rome is considered the world at this point. You remember when Paul says that the gospel has gone to the entire world? Well, did it, did it reach all of the people in Papua New Guinea <laughs> or some island somewhere? Not necessarily. The Bible is talking about the major empire who was ruling the world, and it was divided into three parts, right? We covered um, Constantine II, Constans, and Constantius. Those are mm. the three sons of Constantine, right? So those are the three parts. So when we say three parts or a, par a third of the world or a third of the empire, you know exactly what we're talking about. We also covered yesterday the main two sections of this Roman empire, the main two sections, because the other third portion actually gets consumed into the Eastern Empire, right? So you remember when, when Daniel saw the statue and he saw Rome, it was the legs of iron, iron, the legs of iron. I told you iron uh, was the longest part of the statue. The Roman Empire, um, its prophecies covered the longest time period. It, the femur bone is your longest bone. It is the strongest bone. So too, 
In this statue, the legs were the strongest part of it, right? And we saw how that statue had two legs. So one leg covered the Western Roman Empire and the other leg covered the Eastern Roman Empire. Don't mm. forget, when you're watching the news today and they say East versus West or the Western nations versus the Eastern nations, know that they're just talking about East, Eastern Rome versus Western Rome, right? Mm. Because the legs that had the iron, the iron never goes away, right? When Christ returns, there's still going to be iron mixed with clay iron mixed with clay, right? Some of the nations were strong. Some of the nations were weak. All right, enough of the background. I always want to give you a little bit of background, assuming that somebody is jumping in today and they were not on yesterday or the, the day before or what have you, okay? So here we go. And it says, and the fifth angel, we are on uh, Revelation chapter nine, uh, verse one, Revelation nine, verse one. And it says, and the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven mm. on earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Right? So here we have the fifth angel sounded and a star falls from heaven. Many Christian expositors, including Martin Luther, the great reformer, Sir Isaac Newton, and the historian Edward Gibbon have all seen in the fifth and sixth trumpets the rise and the progress of Islam. Is so in view of the tremendous military, religious, economic, and cultural impact that Islam has had on the world for nearly 1400 years, you think the Bible wouldn't mention it? You think the Bible would not put it in? So, yes, Islam is mentioned here in the Bible, and this interpretation deserves serious attention. Islam is the religion of the followers of Muhammad, and it originated around 612 AD exactly lining up with the fifth church period, exactly lining up with the fifth seal, right? In Luke, uh, Luke 10, 18, the Bible says, and he said unto him, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So we see this fifth angel sounds and a star falls from heaven. Remember when we um, talked earlier in the Bible in Revelation chapter one, that a star represents a leader, and in Revelation 1, the stars were held in God's hand, right? He would not let them go. But a fallen star represents a fallen angel or a fallen messenger that has a fallen message. In mm. Revelation 12, 9, the Bible says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So here we see a fallen star represents a religious messenger. So now we got some religion coming into it, but it's not a true messenger because it is not in God's hand. So Perfect. we have a religious messenger and he's bringing a false religion or a false message. Mm. Um, Pastor Burrell, anything you want to add so far about, about Muhammad or anything, anything about Islam at this point? If not, that's fine. We'll keep pressing forward. Well, I just think it's important to realize this. Uh, 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 Rome went to war against the church. Pagan Rome warred against the church by persecuting them. Papal or religious Rome went to war against God's true church by bringing in all the false doctrines and putting true Christians to death. And, and you read about in Matthew, Jesus gives his church authority to bind and to loose to bind things on earth as they're bound in heaven and to loose things on earth as they're loosed in heaven. What we see happening here spiritually is that the church has apostatized. She's fallen away from Christ. And because she has, has, has left her loyalty to Christ, she has loosed this force on the earth. So sometimes we look at these world religions, these anti-Christian religions like Islam, and we critique them very hard. And we don't realize that prophetically speaking, this force was loosed on the earth because of the unfaithfulness of people that claim to serve God. And that's why they were loosed so that they could ultimately oppress the kingdom of this false religious empire, this false church, and, and be God's judgment upon them just to remind them who was really in charge the whole time that God rules over all the affairs of earth. Amen. Amen. So as this, and you're right, God does, he rules over all of this. And I, I love the way the Bible shows this and reminds us that we don't have to fret. 
We don't have to be afraid because he is in control. As we finish off verse one, and it says, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit, right? So something is going to come up from the bottom. You know, if it comes from God, it comes down from the top. But here, this comes up from the bottom and, and it's going to release smoke and the smoke is going to block the sun. And, and Christ is considered the son of righteousness. What kind of things, when Islam came about, would have come out of this bottomless pit? When Islam came about, they had a new Bible called the Quran, right? And they said that this Bible was dictated uh, to Muhammad by an angel, right? They also have a new God. The new God is called Allah, and Allah does not have a son. You know, what was so important about God the Father having a son is that we needed somebody who understood this human experience and to be able to overcome sin so that we would have a chance to receive salvation by his shed blood. So Allah doesn't have a son that he sends to die for me and you, right? Doesn't shed blood. He doesn't become the lamb that is slain, right? So, um, so if no son, we have no Messiah. The third thing is that, that Islam claims that Jesus is just a prophet. This is some of the smoke that's coming up. He's just a prophet. Well, if he's a prophet and he says that he is a Messiah and you say he's not the Messiah, then what kind of prophet is he? He would be a lying prophet because there's no way that you can claim that he's a prophet but won't believe what he says. Mercy. Right. So this is some of the smoke. And we're going to get into that as we get to the next verse. The next thing is they claim that the Holy Spirit is the angel Gabriel. They claim that the Holy Spirit is the angel Gabriel. Right. We won't go too far into that. But the Bible suggests if we read it through, there's no way that the Holy Spirit could be the angel Gabriel. Because every time when we talk about it, this Holy Spirit uh, is the spirit of God. And, and Gabriel is a created being. He is a created being. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, is not a created being. All right? The next thing is that they believe that all people should be forced to obey the religion or die. Do you remember when um, Herod or Pilate was asking Christ uh, about his kingdom? And Christ says, my kingdom is not of this world. That's right. If it was, the people who were following me would take up arms and fight. But Islam believes that, that you've got to accept this religion or die. And they believe that if they die fighting for this religion or spreading this religion, that they'll go to heaven and get wine and women and all mm. kind of food forever because they died spreading the faith. This mm. is called incredible smoke. Right. Now, you got to understand when somebody accepts Islam, it is difficult for you to come and present the gospel because there are so many other things interfering with them hearing it. It's smoke. It is interfering. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it blocks out this light of Jesus. So when you get a chance to witness, witness. I mean, there's only so much we could do. We are, we are called to be salt and to be light, spread seeds, and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. All right, so let's go on to uh, verse 2. Verse 2. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace and the smoke and the air were darkened by the reason of the smoke of the pit. Remember, we just talked about uh, the smoke coming up. I gave you uh, examples of the smoke and it blocks out the sun. And it says, and the sun and the air were darkened by the reason of the smoke of the pit. The Bible says Jesus is the light of the world. He's the son of righteousness. God's word is truth and light. So all of these things are, are being blocked out and in its place, we have darkness. Darkness is the opposite of light. Uh, it, is, it is error or false teachings. So we see a lot of error and false teachings come out. We've already talked about a star is a, a fallen um, a religious leader. Those kind of things come, out, come about. Now, the Bible is going to give us more detail. I love it. So you, don't not, you and I don't have to feel like we're guessing about what the Bible is talking about. It's going to give us more and more detail. Let's go on to verse 3. And then I'll come to you. Oh, go ahead, Pastor Burrell. Well, I just wanted to, to uh, just give a note that, you know, in Malachi 4 and verse 2, Jesus Christ is called the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. So any, any religion that blocks out the sun is a religion that blocks out Jesus Christ. And I believe it's interesting that when you look on the flag, when you look on the flag that represents Islam, all you see is a moon and a star. The sun is not there. 
And prophecy always just gives these indicators so you know what to look for. And as Brother Felder said, the air, the spirit of God, the breath, the wind of God, they also deny that most important truth as well. Wow, I love that. I never even thought about the flag. There is no sun. There's a moon, moon and, a star. and a star. Wow, awesome. Good stuff, Pastor Morel. All right, verse three, and it says, and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Mm. Now, the Bible's given us more detail so we could understand more about this fifth trumpet. Do you remember we said that a beast represents a nation? A beast represents a nation, and here we have a locust. It's a small, it's a small beast but it represents a small nation. Mm. These, these locusts, they travel in packs or hordes or groups. Each one is a, a small individual part, a small kingdom. When, when Muhammad was growing up or when, when Islam was being formed, his Muhammadan religion, that there were a lot of small groups of people across the desert. You find locusts in the desert. You find them in desolated places. You also find them in in Arabian uh, parts of the world. One of the other clues here in Judges 6, Judges 6, chap uh, Judges chapter 6, verse 5, and Judges 7, 12, it speaks of the Midianite and the Amalekite Arabs. And in the Bible, it says, for they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers and locusts for multitudes. The Midianites and the Amalekites they dwelled in the deserts in the eastern, uh, what would be where the eastern Roman Empire is. So this is where Muhammad comes from, the Arabian Peninsula. These people, they had no king over them. They were just small packets of people who believed the same thing. And the Bible says, and power was given unto them as scorpions of the earth have power. Mm. So how did they get this power? They got this power because there was so much war going on in the world right now between these different empires. Nobody paid attention to them. Nobody paid attention to them. So God almost allows the confusion in one part of the world to allow these people to be raised up. In Isaiah 9, 9, 15, mm -hmm. it says that a tale represents a prophet and their teachers lie. Tale mm. represents a prophet and their teachers lie. So who, who, um, what is the deadly part that the Bible talks about with these locusts? Locusts don't have tails like scorpions. Locusts don't have tails like, they can't sting you, a locust, a grasshopper. But these locusts, they have tails like scorpions. And that's where their power lies. Their power lies in their tail. We find that in Isaiah 9, 15. It says, uh, that the power lies in their tail and their tails are their prophets. Tails are their prophets. Let's continue. And it was commanded that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, mm. neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when it striketh a man. All right. So um, Pastor Burrell, whenever you want to jump in, you let me know. But when the Bible talks about trees and grass are the opposites to the men that are not sealed by God. Right. You remember mm -hmm. the seal of God was his Sabbath. Mm -hmm. We had talked about that earlier. Ezekiel uh, 2012, Ezekiel 2020. Uh, some other Bible verses that we provided you, that was his Sabbath commandment. And Rome was getting rid of the Sabbath. They were switching from Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, to a the first day, which was the Sunday. Rome was switching over. And so that these men, the Bible says, and it was commanded that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither kill any, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which had not the seal in their foreheads. So these locusts were commanded to hurt people, but not to hurt commandment-keeping people. The Islamic conquerors did not destroy property wantingly or kill Christians or Jews so long as they agreed to pay tribute. Mm -hmm. what, did the, what did the early Christians and the Jews have in common? They both kept Sabbath. 
They That's both right. kept Sabbath. And these were the two groups that the 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 uh that Muslims, the the Muslims or the is Islam followers, they said if you pay taxes or if you pay our tribute, we will not destroy you. Mm. They did not offer that same sort of protection to these people who came there on these various crusades. They did it for the people who kept Sabbath, the Sabbath keeping Christians, as well as the Jews. Pastor Burrell? Well, I just, you know, want to jump in and remind us how um, God understood how limited our imaginations would be in this last days because of entertainment and whatnot. So he's painting a very vivid picture. You go back and read the historians, they would literally talk about watching the hordes of invade, invading Muslim armies cross the desert, how it literally looked like smoke. You know, it would just darken the whole landscape or how it literally would look like a herd or swarm, excuse me, of locusts, how a locust swarm literally will darken the air. That's just how thick it will be. And he's showing us this. And, and we read about this. And God takes his, his uh, Sabbath seriously. And in verse five, if I may go on to verse five, where it says to them, it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh the man. We've already made it clear that their torment was in their falsehood. Their torment was in their false religion, right? That's the tail that stings, right? Now they were a literal army. They did a lot of collateral destruction and damage by actually killing and going to war. But ultimately, you know, this deception rose. And this figure of five months is very, very important historically and, uh, and, and also uh, uh, prophetically. Uh, Brother Felder, you want to talk about that, that five months? And, and then I want to make a spiritual note about that five months. Yes. So, you know, we talked about that a day in prophecy is equal to a year. And it says, and to them, it was given that they should not kill them but they should be tormented five months. And mm. their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh the man. So literally five months in Bible prophecy is 150 years. So the reign of, of Islam at this point was exactly from 1299 to 1449, which is 150 years validating that the prophetic time was true. In addition to that, the Bible says that they did not kill them. And it says, and it was given that they should not kill them. So they didn't kill this third portion of the Roman Empire. Not yet. Not yet. So they attacked them and then they would retreat. They would attack them and retreat. It was hmm. torment because they never knew when they were coming. They had no, no bases and fortresses or forts like, like the, the Western Roman Empire had when they were in, in the eastern part. So they didn't have those things. These people were very mobile and very agile because almost the whole army had horses and it gave them a lot of speed, right? So this was part of the torment that they gave them. Later on, we will see that they will kill them. So right now it says that they will torture them for five months for this first 150 year period. And it lines up with the, the fifth seal. But when we get to the sixth seal, they will kill them. They will kill the Eastern part of the Roman Empire. They are fighting against the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Empire is ruled by the emperors who moved their capital from Western Rome in Italy. They moved it over to Constantinople, which is in Turkey, and that's where their kingdom is. And they're constantly being attacked now by Muhammad. Pastor Morel? Yes, yes. And, and the Bible is communicating this to us in stories and pictures. Because God is calling you to make connections as you notice details. Now, this five months is very important because the last time you see five months or 150 days in the Bible is when you go back to Noah and the flood and how the water was on the earth for five, uh, for five months or 150 days. And what was God doing with the flood? He was starting over. He was starting over. And what you see God doing at this time through allowing uh, this Muslim empire to invade and to attack Rome is he's getting ready to start over. This is paving the way, um, uh, uh, this judgment upon the quote unquote, Holy Roman empire is preparing the way for what would come next, the reformation that will start to bring the truth back to light. You know, Pastor Morrell, one thing I think is important because you're talking about this truth of the gospel, this truth of the gospel. 
um, Rome and the papacy was trying to kill the truth of the gospel. Mm. And so sometimes when you talk about the Eastern Roman Empire, people say, um, well, what does that have to do with the papacy? You know, mm. if Islam is fighting the Byzantine or the Eastern Roman Empire, what does that have to do with the papacy? Well, if you study history, you will find out that Muhammad had a wife and her name was Khadija. That was her name. And she was a very uh, wealthy Catholic woman. She was a very wealthy mm -hmm. Catholic woman. And she, she proclaimed that Mary was her redeemer. Mary was her redeemer. Um, and so you find that in Islam, they still honor Mary. They That's still right. honor Mary as, as a, um, divine, a divine person. They, they honor Mary as a divine person. So you see that this influence of the papacy is going on through Islam, right? And this will allow the world at the end to merge these different doctrines and create a new soup. During the Bible days, people wanted to worship Christ's mother. They wanted to worship her. And Christ would say, because they would say, Let, um, bless the, the womb, uh, no, bless the bosom that, that, that you were able to suck, something to that effect. And Christ would say, no, don't honor my mother, honor mm -hmm. my father and do so by keeping his commandments. commandments. Amen. So this is important. I want you to see that the papacy, the Western Roman Empire, it's got a hand to play in what is going on. The papacy has got a hand to play with getting rid of the Eastern Roman Empire. They're, that's their enemy now. They're, they're actually fighting for control of the world. The West, via Islam, is still fighting for control to get rid of its Byzantine, which was its partner, which is now its enemy. Mm. All right. I didn't do that as well as Wolf Blitzer, but hopefully uh, <laughs> the point is becoming clear. Pastor Burrell. And, and just to plant a seed, as we go forward in Revelation, one of the names that's going to be given to the papacy is the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So we're going to see that this one false version of Christianity was the source of, of, of many false religions, Islam, atheism, that, that God takes this very seriously when the gospel is perverted. It, it just wreaks havoc. It gives rise to the birth of all kind of other abominations and false doctrines because Satan is behind it all. He doesn't want people to be saved. He doesn't want people to know Jesus and he doesn't care how you're lost. That's the thing. And that's why we have to make that choice to let Christ be all and all to us and not let Satan have any, any influence, any part of our life. And I, I do want to be clear. I do believe that there would be many sincere Muslims that are going to be saved, many sincere Catholics that are going to be saved. There are going to be people from every denomination, every race, every situation that will be saved. You know, we don't have all of the facts. We will never have all of the facts. The Bible says, uh, in the days of your ignorance, he winked at it. That's right. right? But now that, that the truth is going out, he calls all men to repentance. Some of these, these crises that will happen in the last days will give people an opportunity to hear the truth. And to be able to respond to it, you know, God, we serve a fair God. We serve a just God. James 4, 17, it says, to him who knoweth to do right and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And so I believe many of these sincere people, God is going to call them to this truth. They are going to get this truth of the gospel before it's everlasting too late. All right, so let's pick up at verse 8, verse 8. And it says, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth was as the teeth of lions. And they had, they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots and many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions. And there were stings in their tails. And their power was to hurt men five months. Mm. So when we talk about the hair was hair of women, a, a lot of these um, Muslim fighters, they had long hair. A lot of these Arabian fighters that had long hair. So when it says hair is women, uh, in, in these Bible days, the Bible says that the glory of a woman was her long hair. So John is talking uh, based on his experience, what a woman looked like. Women used to have long hair, men would cut their hair, etc. And so he says they had hair as women and their teeth was as the teeth of lions. That means that they were fierce. These were fierce people because they had long hair 
like John perceived women had long hair, they were fierce fighters. And they had breastplates and they had breastplates of iron and the sound of their wings were as the sound of chariots of many horses. So here we see that um, most of the Arabian and Turkish military uh, was made up of cavalry. They had very few infantry, if any, almost everybody had a horse and the horsemen wore, wore turbans over their long hair as the hair of woman, women. And they came with strength and the rapacity of lions. So these horses came quickly. We know that horses represent war. These horses had no fear and they were seemingly unstoppable. They had breast breastplates of iron. Even during the days of Daniel, the iron was considered to be the strongest metal, even during Daniel's time. So they had breastplates of iron. It was seen as though they were almost invincible, unstoppable, and they did it for five months. The last thing is that they had um, wings. They had wings. These locusts had wings. And if you remember when we talked about um, the leopards, the leopards in, in Daniel 7, that the wings represented speed. So these, these men on horses moved very quickly. And because they had the stinger in their tail, and what was the stinger? The stinger was that they had a prophet. They had a prophet. And the prophet, this is religious zeal. Religious zeal. Nobody fights like a man who's fighting for his nation or for his religion or for his wife. You know what I'm saying? His wife and his children. Those are three things that will make a man fight and be more ferocious than he would ordinarily. Patriotism will make you fight. Religion will make you fight. And love of your family will make you fight. Mm. Right? And you get a different kind of fight out of people when you are dealing with those issues. Pastor Burrell, anything else you want to add before we move forward? I do just want to say this, brothers and sisters, to be clear, be very clear. Uh, whoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. And I'm appealing to every Christian right now is that in your prayer life, in your prayer life, add the dear people of the Middle Eastern world who grow up in cultures that virtually never mention the name of Jesus. Pray, pray that God will reveal himself to these people in mighty ways. And he does it. You should go look up testimonies of, of people who, who call on the name of the Lord and he reveals themselves to him where they often don't have written printed versions of the Bible where he comes straight to them in vision and he tells them and he, and he speaks his word and his truth and he leads them unto salvation. So I'm just appealing to every Christian, you know, we, 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 we are encouraging people to be reading their Bibles from cover to cover, but also as you pray, yes, continue to pray for yourself, your family, whatever local needs that are, are burning on your heart, but, but ask God to give you a burden for this great world need. Just, just be praying, Lord, a, a, a prompt men and women in these places, these Christless countries, just uh, to call on your name and ask him to do it in his own miraculous way and power. And everybody who calls on the name of the Lord, they will be saved. So let's let's just let's add that to our prayer life. Amen, amen. So um, what we find here at verse eleven, at verse eleven, there is a change. There is a change. Remember, at first, this kingdom of locusts, it had no king over them. They had no king, and they were tiny, tiny little packets of people or groups of people, just like locusts come in hordes. Something different happens in verse 11, in verse 11. And it says, and they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in mm. the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. And both of those names, by the way, mean destroyer. He's giving it to you in Hebrew and in Greek. He's just double emphasizing this name to show the strength of this destruction. And it says, one woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. So as we come to the end of the fifth woe, or the fifth, the fifth trumpet, or the fifth woe, we find something different happens with these followers of Islam. A king rises up over them, a very mighty religious king. And, this re and we know it's a religious king because he comes out of the bottomless pit, right? And he is called the angel of the bottomless pit. They, re, they get a king over them, and his name is Othman, Othman, and he is called the Sultan, or the Grand Signor, or the Supreme Caliph. So Othman is the founder of the Ottoman Empire, and he is the civil leader of, the, of, the, of, the, of Turkey, uh, or Istanbul, mm -hmm. as well as over the, the, the followers of Muhammad. He becomes their religious leader. 
but he is also now the civil leader. He has armies now at his disposal. Mm. And, and as the caliph, as the supreme caliph, he is the highest spiritual dignity uh, in the world with regard to Islam. He is the supreme secular authority as well. Do you know that the caliph, the supreme caliph still sits in Turkey? The supreme caliph still sits in Istanbul? Mm -hmm. The world is going to have to reckon with Turkey at some point because if the caliph makes a call from there, different parts of the Arabian world will respond. They will respond as one unit. And if those locusts come together, you know, a tiny enough tiny locusts come together, they will be able to defeat any beast. And if the Bible is true, and I believe that it is, that these, these nations will come together again. You know, it was the first coming together of these nations that allowed the Protestant for um, um, the Protestant movement to go forward, the Protestant Reformation. In, in Europe, the only reason that the papacy was, was not able to snuff out this Protestant Reformation that was started by Martin Luther was because its hands were always full. Every time that they thought they were going to get rid of the Protestants, you got another war, another squirmish coming from Turkey, another situation. God get, did that to give his people space and time to spread the gospel. And he's going to use these skirmishes that come up in the last days to slow down the devil's plan so this word can get out to his people. Again, they use the term Abaddon and Apollyon. They both mean destruction. And having two, two names that are identical emphasizes the character rather than the name of the power itself. This was the character of the Ottoman government. It had a civil power and it had a religious power and they were going to destroy you both ways. They were going to destroy you by pushing forward their, their religious sort of views and they were going to destroy you pushing forth the strength of their armies, these combined mm. armies out of the Arabian Peninsula. Pastor Burrell, anything you want to add there? Wow, just I just you know want to talk about how you gotta pay attention to prophecy. You know, in the movies, you know, when you see movies that talk about the crusade and the holy wars of these middle ages, they always like to paint the quote unquote Christians as the good guys and the Muslims as the bad guys. In reality, what prophecy is showing us is that is that just like God worked with pagan nations throughout history, right? He's working through a pagan nation. And he's using it to judge a false church. So don't let the movies deceive you. Right now in the prophecy, although they are a false religion in the pagan nation, they were doing God's work in putting a check on the quote unquote Holy Roman Empire. That is awesome. You know, Pastor Rell, that kind of goes back to something earlier you were saying. You were saying in television, in the cartoons and in the movies, they got you on the lookout that something is going to come from outer space. And when it comes, we're going to blow it out the sky. Right. Some alien force is going to come. And you were saying that this alien force, according to the Bible and according to Daniel 2, this rock that falls from out the sky and hits the, the nations on its feet, hits the statue on its feet, is none other than Christ. It is a rock that hits the bottom of the statue. The statue is destroyed. The rock becomes a holy mountain. And in all of these movies, Independence Day, all of the Avengers movies, they got the big mother ships coming and they're going to blow it out the sky. It's like the devil is trying to prepare us to bring war or have war against Christ, to have a different perspective. And here you, you showed us with Islam, while in these crusader movies, the, the Islam is always supposed to be our enemy, not realizing that they didn't destroy the Sabbath keepers, the Jews or the Christians who kept Sabbath. Mm. Also, they made room for the gospel to spread through Europe. They were the force that slowed down the papacy from doing the inquisitions that they were doing at a terrible pace. So I, I love the, the, the nice view that you give us. And I love the way you round out the Bible study by, by adding those perspectives. And I really appreciate it. Let's go on to verse 13. Um, Revelation 9, 13. And it says, and the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had a trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Now, this is important. We have the sixth angel, and it has a voice coming from the four horns of the altar, Right? And, and this is the golden altar before God. So God has given this instruction 
with regard to this sixth angel. So these things are not just happening by accident. Do you remember when, when uh, uh, Gabriel told Daniel that uh, Michael came to help me while I was dealing with the king of Persia? These are spiritual wars going on in the background that allow these things to take place when God commands. It happens on his authority when he says so. And he says, saying to the sixth angel, which has the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Earlier on, when we were in Revelation 7, we talked about four angels that were holding back the winds of the entire world. Remember mm. the four corners of the world, these four angels? But these four angels here in Revelation 9, 14, they are localized angels and they are only holding winds back over the great Euphrates River. So the Euphrates River was in a particular place. So these are localized angels. And he says there are four of them. So the sixth trumpet or the second world, these four angels mentioned uh, have a localized power and they come out of the Turkish Ottoman Empire. These are the four different sultancies, four different sultans that rise up and they wreak havoc all over the world, right? They are Aleppo, Iconium, Damascus, and Baghdad, mm. right? They moved against the Western Roman world. Rome didn't know where they were going to strike. One day they were hitting in Spain, the next day it was Portugal, and they had a constant stream of forces coming against them. So the Bible calls them angels, right? These Baz the Byzantine Empire had been holding the Muslims in check. So up until this point, these four, four sultans were not able to wreak havoc on the, on the Roman Western world like it would have. But the Byzantine Empire at this point was destroyed. They get destroyed. And when they get destroyed by these four angels, there's nobody holding them in check. Mm. And if you remember earlier, two, two verses ago, when, when Islam attacked the Byzantine Empire, the Bible says it was only tormented for 150 years. But this angel, this sixth angel is going to kill it. It's going to kill a third of the empire. This is the last part of the Roman Western Empire that was still standing. I mean, sorry, yeah, this is the last part of the Eastern Roman Empire that was standing. It, Islam sort of weakened it. And now we're going to find the Ottomans, which are now added the, the civil power to the religious, the religion of Islam. They've added an additional element, and they are going to put the death, the death dagger into the West, uh, Eastern Roman Empire. You remember when we talked about a guy yesterday, his name was Odieser. He was the one that put the, the knife into um, Western Rome, where he was the final person to get rid of the, the emperors in the Western Rome, which caused the papacy to rise up? Well, this guy right here, the Ottoman Empire, these four sultans, Aleppo, Iconium, Damascus, and Baghdad, are going to be the one that are going to play out a bunch of wars that are ultimately going to get rid of the Roman Byzantine Empire. So mm -hmm. these Islamic wars played a key role in helping Protestants, Protestantism um, thrive, in Europe, and as well as help the gospel to spread throughout the world. Pastor Burrell? Yes, I just want to um, remind us that back in the uh, fifth and sixth chapter of Revelation, Revelation chapter five and six, three very key questions emerged that just help us to stay focused during the book. The question was asked, who is worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals or who is worthy to judge? The answer was Christ, okay? Then the question is asked in chapter six, it says, how long, O Lord, till you judge? That question was asked from under the altar before God in the fifth seal. And now we're getting an answer, right? Because a voice came, a voice came from the altar, from the four horns of the altar. And if you know, that's where the blood was placed. That's where Christ was interceding. He was given a command. All right, it's time to judge. It's time to judge this false church that's been persecuting the true church. And also the other question, who shall be able to stand on God's great day of wrath? So those three questions are helping us to, to understand everything that we read. And I just want to remind everybody here right now, we're living in a spiritual battle. 
Christ was watching over this whole scene. He was listening to the prayers of his saints. He was watching the oppression of the false Roman church. And he heard that cry coming up. And he finally said, look, it is time. I'm going to unleash. Psalm 34, verse 7 says, The angel of the Lord encamps around about them that fear him and delivereth them. I want to let you know right now, I don't care who you are, what you've been through, where you stand with God, the reality is that God is merciful and there are things that the devil, if he could, he would snap his fingers and destroy your life. He would kill you. He would have you in a car wreck, comatized, paralyzed. He'd have somebody mug you and shoot you and blow your brains out. And God is constantly holding these things back because God is not interested in people dying outside of Christ. So he holds these things that back. He, he protects us and he's asking, will we fear him, honor him, serve him, keep his commandments? Will we love him? Right. And what happened in this situation is they gave up on the fear of God. They gave up on honoring God. They gave up on keeping his commandments. And, and, and Christ finally said, look, look, go ahead. I've been holding this back, but I just got to let it come in his fury. I got to let it come in his fury. I want you to know God is protecting you. He is holding Satan's evil back off your life. Now is that time just to say, Lord, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to fear you. I'm going to honor you right now. Just, just, take it, just take advantage of all of God's goodness and his grace. And, 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 and don't leave him hanging. Amen. 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 So let's pick back up at verse 15. Let's pick back up at verse 15. And it says, and the four angels were loose, which were prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year. Mm. This is prophetic time. Remember, a day stands for a year. And so when we put this time together, it literally comes up to 391 years which indicated the time remaining for the Ottoman Empire to do his work. What was the work they were supposed to do? For it to slay the third part of men. So this is the very last piece of the um, Eastern Roman Empire. And God does it. He does it exactly in his time. So from the end of the fifth trumpet, which was 1449, 391 years exactly extended to 1840. If you remember 1840 or thereabouts is the beginning of the seventh trumpet. It mm. is the beginning of the seventh church. Remember the Laodicean church? God is making a way for the very last church to come about. What I also find important is earlier on, Islam was only able to torment uh, Eastern Rome. But this last power, these four, four generals or four sultans that came about, they were actually able to slay and destroy it. And the Bible gives a deadline for the destruction. So the destruction was going to have for, happen for 391 years. What happened after the 391 years? Mm. So exactly uh, in August 11th of 1840, the Turkish leader signed a paper that took away his independence and the power of the Turkish sultan forever. Mm. He signed a concordance or a treaty with the four great powers of Europe to protect uh, Turkey. Turkey could no longer protect itself. It went from being the strongest force on the world to now it can no longer protect itself. It ended that portion uh, that God said it would end exactly when he said it would, it would be over. And up until that time, they had continued to attack the Eastern uh, Roman Empire and they completely destroyed it. And so the last power that remains is going to happen during this seven, the seventh trumpet or the seventh seal or the seventh church. This last power, we call it the new world order. But as we get to Revelation 13, Revelation 14, we're going to see there's nothing new under the sun. That the papal power will come back for a mm. final act, the Bible says. Mm. It will become as strong as it ever was. Just like it was during those 1,260 years from 538 all the way up to 1798. We call those the dark ages. The Bible says that Rome will rise again. The empire will strike back. You thought you were just watching movies. They was telling you what's about to happen. The empire will strike back. The Roman empire. Pastor Burrell? Brothers and sisters, if I could summarize Revelation in one word, it would simply be the hour of his judgment has come. Everything is pushing us toward 
this moment of the hour when Christ stands as judge to make the final decision on the destinies of men. Chapter one says the time is at hand. Go through the seven churches. He says, behold, I set before you an open door. You go through that door and you see the court set up and Christ is standing as the judge. The hour is at hand. And even these trumpet blasts, the trumpets are being blown, preparing us for what? For this day of judgment, just like back in Israel. They blew those trumpets for 10 days to prepare for the Day of Atonement. Here in Revelation, we have seven trumpets that prepare us for that time when the temple of God in heaven is open and the Ark of His Covenant, His Ten Commandment Law, is revealed and everybody has to stand with the decisions they've made in this life. Amen. Amen. And, and as we go a little bit further, uh, John gives us more detail about how uh, the Western, the Eastern Roman Empire actually collapsed. And he says, and the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, mm -hmm. and I heard the number of them. So in ancient times, the cavalry was the, swift, the swiftest and strongest of any, any sort of part of a mobile military. And all of their soldiers had horses. They were believed that they had 2 million men on horses came and ultimately destroyed the Byzantine Empire when they came for their final battle, it caused them to take a look and, and, and know that there was no way that they could prevail, right? But John also uses these kind of numbers to say that it's a number you can't count. Remember when he says that the angels were uh, 10,000 times 10,000s and thousands of thousands? John was just overwhelmed by the numbers. He was overwhelmed by the numbers. Let's go a little bit further and pick up at verse 17. And it says, and I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and of brimstone, of fire, of jacinth and of brimstone. Here right now, John is actually going to tell you the colors of their uniform. Their uniform was red, right, which represented the fire. Their colors of the uniform were red, uh, blue, which is represented by jacinth, and smoke or yellow, which is brimstone, brimstone. So these were the colors of the Turkish army, red, yellow, and blue, red, yellow, and blue. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. What was John looking at when he says that out of the horse's mouth comes fire and smoke and brimstone? This is the first war that is being fought where um, you have soldiers on cavalry and they have pistols. They have pistols. And if you ever seen those cowboy movies while the 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 um what's the 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 cavalry is coming or the good guy or the cowboy or whatever is riding on a horse and he puts the, the gun out and the horse's face is right here and right next to the horse's face you see the gun. And so John is seeing a man on a horse with a pistol and he's seeing projections coming out of the horse's mouth. This is what it looks like. John is trying to explain something that is difficult. It's like asking a caveman to explain what he sees on television, right? So John is saying, out of their mouths issue fire and smoke and brimstone. Mm. The other thing that happened during this war that, that was going on now between the, um, the Turks and the Byzantine Empire, this was also the first war that mobile cannons were used. Mm. Mobile cannons had never been used before in any war. You have pistols, you have rifles, and you have mobile cannons. Before now, they did have cannons, and these cannons were stationary, and they did put them on the sides of a, a, um, a castle or something to that effect. But the, the Turks were able to make the cannons mobile. They were able to bring them out into the battlefield, and they had hundreds of them. This is one of the reasons that they were able to defeat the Byzantine uh, emperor. And it says, by these three was the third part of men killed. When it says the third part of men, it's talking about the final portion of this Roman Empire, the final portion of this Eastern Roman Empire, by the fire, by the smoke, and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. So out of their mouths, we see cannons, we see gunpowder, we see pistols. These are things that really changed the way wars were fought. Up until now, you had knights on horses that mm. wore uh, iron iron uniforms, you know, like those old Crusader movies, but a, a, the Crusader in an iron, uh, cast iron outfit couldn't stop a bullet, couldn't mm. stop a cannon, you know, couldn't stop a rifle. And this changed the way war was going to be fought. Do you know that this same technology 
that was offered by the Chinese. They had tried to sell it to the Byzantine emperor and he didn't like the price. He didn't like the price, so he didn't take it. So they end up selling it to the Turks and the Turks used this technology to bring about their end. Uh, anything you want to add, Pastor Morel, before we go on? Not at this moment, no, sir. All right, here we go. And verse 20, and it says, the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and the idols of gold and of silver mm. and of brass and of stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Verse 21, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Now, if any of these terms sound familiar, these were terms that we have found when we have talked about the churches, the seven churches. And, and, and in these terms that were being used, it was talking about the idol worship that was going on in papal Rome. God had used these hundreds of years with, with Islam and with the Turks that the papacy was supposed to cry out and repent. These were judgments. God doesn't send judgments just to destroy us. Remember Pastor Burrell says that adversity and trial are God's ministers that are supposed to draw us back to him. Amen. The papacy didn't repent after all of these things. God's object in sending these judgments was not just to punish them, but to cause them to repent of their errors. It says the rest of the men were said to still worship idols. So the Western Roman church still worshiped the images of the saints. They mm. talked about St. Peter was the, or St. Patrick was the, the, the guardian of travel. And St. Peter was the God of this and St. Jerome. And they worshiped these saints. God was saying, listen, the saints can't save you. My. The men also did not repent of their murders. There were a lot of um, the inquisitions where they murdered 50 million of the, the Christian believers. They had burned them at stakes. They had fed them to lions. They had tortured them. So they didn't repent for any of those things. They also didn't change the truth or the false truth that they were putting out. You know, the Bible calls idol worship uh, fornication, spiritual uh, fornication, right? So they had uh, so many doctrines of impurities, and then they had thefts. You remember when I told you that they made people pay uh, for, for confession. They made them pay for forgiveness of sins. They made them pay mm. to get married. They made them pay to die. They made them pay everything that was always taking money from the people. Bible calls it theft. Will a man rob God? When you're taking money that is due to God, meaning spreading the gospel, and use it for something else, God calls it theft. So they were usurping God's authority. They even called themselves, the head of the papacy called themselves the Holy Father. This was a term that was specifically reserved for the creator of heaven and earth. They took his name. They took his day. They changed the sacraments. They did all kinds of things to get God's attention. And they got it. They got his attention. So, Pastor Burrell, anything you want to add as we land the plane? Well, as we land the plane, I just simply want to say this, brothers and sisters, you remember, or maybe if you weren't here, we, we read in Revelation how at the beginning of the church's history, Christ was in charge of the church. He was the rider on the right horse. He was victorious and he went for it to conquer. And then all these evil forces came warring against God's church, persecution warred against church, compromise and false doctrine and, and, and all of these false practices came to war against God's church. And what we're seeing here now in the trumpets is God fights back. Throughout history, God has cared for his people. He has protected his people. These trumpets are sounding. Uh, all these events in history are as wake-up calls to us, right? Because remember, this is taking us all the way now to the 19th century. Here we are in 2021. We live in the days of the sounding of the seventh trumpet. That last trumpet is about to blow, and that final trump says it's over. The trumpet is the note of war. Yes, we live in a battle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. The trumpet is a note of danger to God's enemies that the final judgment is coming, and we have to, we have to take advantage when it says that God gives us space to repent. We have to use our time wisely. 
But brothers and sisters, for those who are believing and trusting in God, that trumpet blast means number one, repentance, right? <laughs> The, the trumpet tells us that we have to repent of our sins. We have, to, we have to know what it means to do right and to forsake wrong. But that trumpet blast also means deliverance. Our deliverance is drawing nigh. We should be looking forward with great hope and great joy to the day when that final trumpet shall sound. That, that's the day when the problems and the trials of this earth end. And that's the day when we're gonna be ushered into the heavenly kingdom to be with our Lord. So we should be joyous. We should be joyous, but we just have to take it very seriously right now when God lovingly and kindly gives us space to repent and the trumpet blasts and it exposes our sins, not for the point of discouraging us, but for the point of helping us to, to put everything at Jesus' feet and to stop playing games and to actually let him be the Lord of our lives, the way we say it with our mouth, to actually let him do it in reality so we can be his pure bride in this earth. Amen. Amen. Uh, Pastor, as we close, I just want to try to hit some of the comments. We have so many comments in the thread and so many comments on, on Facebook. So I definitely want to try to hit a few of these comments, if that's okay with you. Oh, amen. Uh, Sister Sandra says, God never punishes severely until he has warned clearly. Amen. How kind of him. Um, somebody else on, on Facebook says, uh, God always has a reason for what he, what is going on in your life at all times. You have to stay in the word for yourself so you can hear what God is telling you to do. Too many, for, too many voices will confuse you. Too many voices mm. will confuse you. All right. Um, Shara on the thread says, it is written, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5, 8. Uh, and Pastor Morrell, feel free to chime in if there are any, any um, comments that you see that you want to bring up. Sister, Sister Tondra said something very, very simple. She said, prayer is the key. You know, brothers and sisters, you never know if your prayer might be the prayer that brings a nation down, right? Everything we read here is the answer to prayer. How long, O oh Lord? And we see him answering in prayer by blowing the trumpet and bringing judgments upon an, uh, an, an empire that refused to honor him. So you never know your prayer. Your prayer might just be the prayer that shakes the nations. It might be your prayer might be that prayer that tips the scale where people have been praying for years. And finally, God says, man, one more person cried out to me about this. I, I, I'm not going to sit any longer. It's time to act. So thank you for just reminding us very simply. Prayer is the key, brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm just looking to see, um, it says, praise God. This is a, 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 a note from Facebook. Praise God. He has sincere people in every religion that will be saved. And it says, um, Acts 1730, but now God commandeth all men to repentance, right? Somebody put that Amen. in there. And, and uh, Sister Sandra reminded us in Ezekiel 1832, and let's remember this, brothers and sisters, God has no pleasure in the death of one that dies. God does not punish willingly, does not afflict the sons of men happily. No, this is, this is his strange work, but he does execute justice and righteousness in this earth. And that means he does have to uh, bring about these acts, these acts of rectification. So, but he does not do it because he enjoys killing and bloodshed. No, not at all. Not at all. Thank you for reminding us of that. I want to bring out one last comment and then we, we will um, talk about C to C and then we'll pray and close. I thought this was great. Sister Shara said that we too have heavy artillery. You know, the, um, the, the, the Turks were able to destroy the Byzantine Empire by bringing in heavy artillery. They brought in the cannons, they brought in horses with guns. I mean, horses having guns and rifles, gunpowder. She says, we too have heavy artillery when we are fighting our spiritual battles. Mm. She says, prayer and fasting is our Amen. heavy artillery. So, I mean, I, I think that is wonderful. You know, th the Bible says that this is our sword. The Bible is our sword. Amen. Uh, this is the offensive weapon that Ephesians 6 tells us to use when we are in spiritual as well as physical struggles. Mm. You know, just for physical struggles as well. But if she says heavy artillery. Remember Christ told the disciples in Mark chapter 9, they were trying to cast the demon out of the boy and in Christ and um Christ cast them out and the, uh, the disciples couldn't. And then the disciples asked Christ, why couldn't we cast the demon out of the boy? And Christ said that mm. this, kind, this kind of deliverance comes only by fasting 
and prayer. You look at you need to look at Mark, Mark chapter nine. I mean, we are living in the age that there are so many things coming up against us that we have got to turn to some extra artillery. Start with the Bible, finish with the Bible, but we better make sure that we pray and fast as well. That God yeah. will give us clarity and give us strength. All right. Also, um, Sister Tanja wanted to remind everybody, for those of you who call in, we have a phone line as well that people get on as early as 5 a.m., believe it or not. Uh, we do praise and worship for one hour on the phone before we ever get on here. Uh, so she just want to remind me about that. If anybody wants the number for praise and worship, just text me 202-409-4456. Sister Tanja, also, you're welcome to put that number in the thread. We do praise and worship every Sabbath. Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. And we also do it every Sunday. Every Sunday from five to six in the morning, we do praise and worship. You are welcome mm -hmm. to join us. Amen. As we close out, I want to remind you about Cover to Cover. Cover to Cover is our Bible reading initiative. And literally, we give you a Bible reading plan. We actually give you three different Bible reading plans that will help you get to the Bible in one year, right? Whatever your religion or denomination, it doesn't matter. You know, read the Bible for yourself. We're not asking you to read it even with us. But take the Bible reading plan, share it with at least 10 people, and challenge them to also read the Bible in one year right? You, you hold them accountable, let them hold you accountable, just like you did with the ice bucket challenge or the, the, the red nose challenge or whatever other challenge that y'all have been into. This one, lives are at stake with this challenge. We stand between the living and the dead when we use this word of God, right? So I'm mm. asking you to join the cover to cover challenge. Uh, all you have to do is text me 202 409 Just say cover to cover or C to C. We will send you the outline for the challenge. Feel free to share it with 10 other people. I don't care how long you've been in the church. I don't care if you're a new believer, a non-believer, or you've been in the church 50 years. Read the Bible again, cover to cover in 2021. A lot of these things are important. And reading the Bible from cover to cover puts all of the pieces together. So again, if you're online, if somebody could be so kind as to put my number on Zoom, Somebody on Facebook, you're welcome to put my number on there. A lot of you know my number by now. Just text me, text me. And those of you on YouTube, if somebody on YouTube in the chat feed could be so kind as to put the number 202-409-4456. And if anybody wants a copy of any of the Bible studies up until now, just text me. I'll send you the whole list of all of the Bible studies up until now. And on social media, please hit like and share. Like them and share them so we can get the word out about what is going on right now now. With that being said, Pastor Morell, if you can close us out in prayer. Amen. And and just before I pray, if I may, just being the Sabbath day, being the Sabbath day, I want to um, I want to talk about that heavy artillery, brothers and sisters, prayer and fasting. I know somebody on this line needs special deliverance, special deliverance in some area of your life. Uh, the reason that that kind of special deliverance comes through prayer and fasting, the heavy artillery, is because when you need a special deliverance, Something has to happen in your body for God to have full and free access to your mind. So, so don't take that call lightly. A lot of times there are things going on in our body that hinder God's access to our mind. And your mind is where faith and hope and love ultimately happen. Okay, so, so let's just remember that if you need that special deliverance, you know, join with God. Join with God and come to him in the season of prayer and fasting. Um, that'll be something good for you. And also for those who are reading the Bible cover to cover, I just want to give this nugget. At the end of the day, I, I am a pastor, so I'm all about trying to help the sheep to actually to actually be fed. Um, somebody maybe has not started cover to cover because you're like, man, that's just going to be too much to try to read the Bible like that. Maybe some people have been doing it. Maybe you've gotten discouraged along the way because it's like, man, just trying to read this thing is, is hard. One very good way to read the Bible like that is, is something that ancient Christians used to do because they had to. One good way to read the Bible is to write it, is to write it. Open up your Bible to that day's reading and just write out that portion of scripture for yourself. Write your own copy of it. Uh, open up your Bible and just sit there and write it. And as you write it, it makes you just read through it nice at a nice, slow, even pace. And you'll find yourself like, wow, I read, I read through today's portion and I actually saw many things because you actually took time to write it out with your hand. That's just a little encouragement to somebody. I was just impressed that somebody needed some encouragement for actually getting through these Bible readings and seeing, and seeing some real value and significance because sometimes it might feel like you're just doing some rigor or some discipline trying to make yourself read all these chapters. 
No, try that. Try that. Open up to that day's reading. Get you some blank paper, some lined paper. Get yourself a nice smooth pen or a nice sharp pencil and just write out that day's reading. Uh, Christians used to do that all the time because they had to. And now we don't have to. We don't do it. But I promise it is. Um, and the Bible talks about it, but I'm not getting into it right now. Uh, it is a good practice to actually solidify God's word in your mind and to help you to actually read you know, the way you want to, to really benefit day by day from this cover to cover. Thank you for letting me give that last note. Brothers and sisters, um, let us pray. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the prophecies of your word. Ultimately, they point us forward to the salvation that Jesus Christ purchased, that Jesus Christ is making real as our high priest through his Holy Spirit pour it out into our hearts. Thank you for the salvation that Jesus is finalizing in this hour of his judgment. Father, I'm just praying that you help us to take full advantage of all the work you're doing. Help us to, to come to you in humility and prayer and fasting. Help us to get into this word and day after day to read it, to absorb it, to digest it. Father, I'm just praying, Lord, strengthen your army. We do see the earthly armies, they go forward with, with, with fire and brimstone, with the speed of horsemen and large numbers like locust. Lord, raise up your army. You say that in these last days when you raise up your army, that you're going to lighten the whole earth with your glory. Father, help us to expect it. Help us to want it. Help us to cry out for it. Help us to be willing and to die for it, that we can just fight for you in these last days because you've been fighting for us. And so often you're lacking a real man and a real woman who's willing to fight for you, Lord. Sanctify us by your blood. Set us apart unto your glorious work. May we be that glorious bride without spot, stain, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing, but holy, holy unto you is our prayer. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. May we give him power in our lives by making that choice to say yes to him, we ask in Jesus' name, let the saints of God say, amen, amen, and amen. Amen, amen, and amen again. Amen. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for uh, joining with us. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to talk about a mighty angel. We're going to talk about a mighty angel tomorrow. And that mighty angel is Christ. We're going to talk about Christ tomorrow. It's going to be a, a little interlude and... Um, I'm excited about it. Join us here tomorrow, same time, same place. I look forward to seeing each of you at the gates of the kingdom. What would it profit us?